Hello, strange loop. I'm really sorry I couldn't be there. I wish I could see all of you, meet all of you in person, but I was unable to make it. Uh, I sure hope we can hang out later on Slack uh, to talk more about program synthesis and uh, informal methods in general. So let me get started. Second. There has been a lot of uh, buzz recently in academia and in industry in the last uh, decade or so about automating programming, generating code that is correct by construction, program synthesis, uh, neural programming, AI, pair, pair programmers, and so on and so forth, right? Now, while we may not all agree on what these exactly mean or manage to accomplish, uh, for this law, uh, talk, let me just refer to all of these buzzwords and efforts as program synthesis, okay? And, and we, can, we can debate their meaning later on Slack. So program synthesis is actually not a recent keyword at all. And uh, it goes back at least to the 1950s uh, to a problem uh, posed by none other than George about circuit synthesis. And also uh, we attribute it to this uh, paper from the 1970s by Manna and uh, Waldinger, which is quite dramatically titled as synthesis as being uh, the dream, uh, as something that takes a dream and, and converts it into a program. So let's spin down the definition, right? So what exactly do I mean by program synthesis in this talk? Well, uh, it's the problem of automatically generating a program that uh, conforms to a user's intent or, or a dream. Uh, and there are three main uh, parts to this pro problem, if you see, which are interrelated. How should one specify the user intent? How should uh, one design or implement the synthesizer given a certain user intent? And uh, again, uh, given a certain user intent and a synthesizer, how should one ensure that the programs that are generated indeed conform uh, to the user's intent? Or even better, can one actually design a synthesizer that can generate programs that are uh, correct by construction, right? So uh, what George and uh, Manna and Waldinger uh, proposed was that the user provide complete formal specifications of the program's expected behavior, okay? Given which the synthesizer uh, could then systematically deduce a program that is guaranteed to be correct by construction which is great, uh, but let's look at what these specifications could look like. Uh, so here on the right, I have a program that is actually computing the max of three uh, integer valued variables. So if one wanted to specify this uh, using a complete formal specification, uh, all we would need to do is to provide uh, this lovely specification, right? And, and this is fairly easy for a lot of folks, but I think we can debate about whether it is easy in general, right? And in fact, it's not at all uh, clear if it's for the average programmer, if this is easier than to come up, uh, than to write the program itself. So uh, what we would truly like is to perhaps tell the synthesizer as little as possible, and have the synthesizer somehow read our mind. In fact, if we wanted to democratize programming and make it more accessible, this is what we would need, right? We don't want people to have to write these complete uh, logical specifications. So inductive program synthesis seeks to address this particular specification problem in classical program synthesis and more ambitiously democratize programming by only asking users to provide a hint of the uh, programmer's expected behavior, okay? So uh, for instance, we might ask the user to just uh, state the problem in, in uh, what she wants in plain old English, right? Hey, can you write me a program to ma compute the maximum of three integers? Or maybe uh, uh, the user can give the synthesizer some more information such as the name of the function, its type signature and so on. And, this, and you know that Copilot uh, can handle uh, information like this, right? Or perhaps uh, we uh, try to take a step towards uh, specifying more correct behavior and we give a few examples of the expected input output behavior of the program, right? Now, all these uh, uh, specifications that I showed you are instances of partial or incomplete uh, specifications, okay? And uh, hopefully we can all agree that these tasks are certainly easier than writing the program itself and also can be done uh, quite easily by non-expert users 
who may or may not be able to or willing to write uh, formal specifications, right? All right, so uh, let me also state that not only uh, does the specification problem get easier with inductive synthesis, but if you consider the synthesis task itself, remember that's the second part to the synthesis problem. If you consider the design of the synthesizer itself, it becomes significantly more practical, more automatable, more scalable, when the problem is to find a program that is simply consistent with the set of examples as opposed to uh, finding a program that is consistent with the logical specification over the entire input domain, okay? So in fact, if one poses the uh, synthesis problem carefully, then the design of the synthesizer can reduce to the design of a smart search algorithm. Remember that, uh, remember that the classical program synthesis used deduction-based uh, uh, program synthesizers and Today, uh, it's, it's more practical to view this as a search problem, okay? So how does this uh, exactly set up? Uh, some, suppose we allow the synthesizer to additionally accept a syntactic uh, template of the space of possible programs, the program space, in the form of a grammar or some domain-specific language or uh, an incomplete program with holes, some kind of partial program or skeleton or, or more recently uh, in the form of some classes of publicly available code in uh, GitHub and other repositories, right? So if we have this program space, then the task of the synthesizer can be defined as essentially to find a program in this program space that is consistent with the partial specification, okay? This is a search problem. So I just said that uh, this setup of inductive program synthesis and partial specifications makes the specification problem easier, makes the design of the synthesizer easier, but what about correctness, okay? So this is indeed a challenge and it's easier to see why this is a challenge if one uh, notes that inductive program synthesis can be viewed as an in instance in general of inductive learning, right? Where the goal is to learn a general function or rule from a specific input output pairs. Now, inductive learning is great, but it is, uh, it has lots, it suffers from many, many complications, right? Such as ambiguity, overfitting, brittleness, which makes it very hard to reason about the correctness of the inferences and classifications uh, obtained in, in, uh, in uh, such learning engines. So let's see um, how these, uh, what these mean in the context of inductive program synthesis. And to illustrate this better, let me just focus on the case where uh, our partial specifications are input output examples. And so they capture at least some notion of, of correctness, right? So ambiguity in the context of inductive program synthesis means that there can be a large number of programs that are consistent with a set of examples, okay? Uh, that might be fine, but unfortunately, uh, not all of these programs are going to exhibit the implicit intended behavior on unseen inputs, right? And hence, the, some of these programs are going to overfit to the examples and they may not generalize to unseen inputs. So uh, let's not go through uh, why this program is wrong, but I can uh, look tell you that later on Slack. But the problem with overfitting is that because some programs may uh, satisfy the implicit specifications and others may not, the synthesizer could very well uh, output a program that is consistent with the examples, but overfits and does not generalize, right? Now there's another issue called, uh, which I refer to as brittleness, right? So to illustrate what this is uh, in the context of inductive program synthesis, let's take this scenario and focus on this last input output example, which I have highlighted, okay? Now, if, if we just swap these last two inputs, right? So you see that this is essentially the same uh, list, if you will, of elements, except uh, the last two inputs are swapped. Then we have an instance of a synthesizer uh, switching from an incorrect program to the correct one, okay? Essentially to a program that is semantically quite different uh, from the program it generated earlier. And this is a case that I, that I found out while playing around with the synthesizer, okay? So this does happen. So uh, now that we know all these problems, how do we deal with correctness, okay? Have we lost out already on the dream of program synthesis? 
Well, not really. I mean, because uh, inductive program synthesis inherits all these problems from, uh, from inductive learning, the sensible path forward is to also learn from and adapt its solutions, right? Uh, so how does one address these issues in inductive learning? Well, uh, inductive bias, of course, right? Uh, which is essentially a set of assumptions made by a learning algorithm in order to perform induction, which is essentially generalization from a finite set of observations into a general function over the domain. And a common one, for instance, is Occam's razor, which assumes that the simplest hypothesis that is consistent with the observations is the best, right? And guides the learning algorithm accordingly. So in inductive program synthesis, there has been already a lot of work and most existing work attempts to guide the search for the desired program uh, by applying inductive biases on the program space such as uh, OCAM's razor, which in this context corresponds to the smallest program, or by designing highly structured uh, DSLs or domain-specific ranking functions, or more recently uh, by using neural guided heuristics, right? And all of which can be done with or without interaction with the user. Now, uh, it turns out if you look at them carefully, all of these, right, including the ranking functions, the search heuristics, are almost always based on syntactic features of programs. So while these syntactic notions of inductive bias have certainly made inductive program synthesis more effective and have enabled us to mo get more ambitious about realizing the dream of program synthesis, the ambiguity, overfitting, and brittleness problems are uh, far from solved. Okay? So now the question is, what's the next step towards realizing the dream, the dream. How do we better uh, do better generalization in inductive program synthesis? So here's my answer in brief. Let's look towards semantics. Okay, and I'm not the first one to realize this. There have already been some efforts in applying various notions of semantic biases to the search space in the form of types, for instance, or some uh, some kinds of um, abstract program semantics or some uh, semantics of uh, DSL operators or components, again, with or without a user. And I think all of these are steps in the right direction, okay? But there is still a lot more to be done in terms of exploring uh, opportunities, uh, theories, and techniques for semantically biasing search spaces. Uh, because semantic biases are still uh, definitely not among the first things that come to mind when designing or developing an inductive synthesis engine. So this uh, finally brings me to the focus of our work and really the topic of this talk, uh, our Mantis project on semantics guided inductive synthesis, okay? So many of the ideas here have been in the works uh, for several years. Some of our initial ideas were in the space of inductive program repair uh, in this uh, CAV 2016 paper on CLOSE and in this PLDR 2019 paper on SEM cluster. And I'm not going to dive too deep uh, into these, but let me just tell you about them briefly, right? So inductive program repair can essentially be viewed as a synthesis problem and requires thinking about the distance between two programs, okay? So you want to modify the incorrect program in a way such that uh, you do not generate a program that is too different from the original program, right? So this requires a notion of program distance. And in these two papers, we defined and showed the effectiveness of using certain notions of program distance that are based on semantic features of programs. Typical notions of program distance are based on syntactic features. Okay, How much did you change the program syntax, uh, for instance? So we said you know, we, we need to think about semant how, how, how much does a modification, modification change the semantics of a program and propose various notions of uh, program distance. But that's all I'm going to tell you right now. Let's uh, talk more about this on Slack if you're interested. What I want to spend most of the remaining time on is our uh, work on semantics guided program synthesis. Okay. So let me start with the ideas in our uh, recent popple paper on, on Sketch AX. Now, uh, let's go back to this problem of ambiguity, right? Where there can be many programs that are consistent with a set of examples, but not all of these programs exhibit the 
implicit intended behavior on unseen inputs, right? And hence may overfit uh, to the examples and fail to generalize on uh, to unseen inputs. Now, suppose in this maximum example, right? This, we have this, this, the illustrative example I'm showing all, uh, all along is that is the same one. It computes the maximum of three integer value variables. Now, suppose in this example, uh, an Oracle magically tells us, uh, informs us about a certain property of the program. Okay. In particular, suppose the Oracle tells us that the program is permutation invariant. So the program output does not change when the elements of the program input are permuted. With this additional knowledge, it turns out that for this example, it's the synthesizer is able to eliminate the incorrect program and steer its search to the correct program. Okay, so permutation instance is a relational property, and this is clearly an instance of applying a semantic bias to the search space. All right, so perhaps you are thinking now, how should one apply this bias? How does one apply the bias? Uh, how does one bias the program space towards finding programs that satisfy permutation invariance? So we could, of course, ask an oracle or the user uh, to write up a logical formula that encodes permutation invariance and ask the synthesizer to enforce it, right? But this would defeat all the tractability arguments I made earlier uh, for inductive synthesis, okay? So we need to try to apply this bias efficiently using some partial specification of permutation invariance so that we stay, respect the spirit of inductive synthesis, right? So here's a simple, uh, clever idea, okay? Why not apply this property to the given examples by simply permuting the inputs and uh, keeping the output unchanged, thereby generating additional examples, okay? Now this has the intended effect of placing a semantic bias on the search space, okay? So this is great. Can we now uh, apply uh, this, uh, uh, can we apply other properties uh, semantic biases corresponding to other properties in a similar way, because this seems like a very simple way to bias a uh, program space. Now, the answer is yes. In fact, for a large class of relational properties that essentially relate the change in the program input to the change in the program output, we can use this very same technique of applying the uh, semantic bias, okay? And uh, I'll refer you to the paper, to our popular paper for a fairly general formulation uh, for all these properties, but let me just mention a few other uh, properties that uh, are subsumed uh, by this class of properties. So we've already talked about permutation ingredients, there's permutation preservation. Uh, so the permutation in the output is the same as the permutation in the input or value invariants. If you apply uh, an affine transformation to the input, the output remains unchanged or value preservation, which says that the uh, output has the same affine transformation as the as the input, and so on and so forth. Okay, so for all of these uh, relational properties, we can essentially apply the same clever strategy for uh, which takes a set of user provided examples and applies the property to obtain a larger set of examples that include the perturbed examples. Right. So this is our key strategy. It's very simple for biasing the search. Augment examples with properties and then use an existing inductive synthesizer. You're not even redesigning the synthesizer to generate a program from these augmented examples, okay? And yes, I hope you have noticed that this is similar to the idea of data augmentation in machine learning, right? Where for instance, for learning an image classifier uh, that can generalize better to unseen images, one generates a larger training data set by applying various transformations or perturbations to the original data set of images, right? So uh, ours is definitely similar, but our domain and perturbations are different. For instance, we don't limit ourselves only to label preserving transformations, right? We also support perturbations where the labels or the outputs can change with respect to the input changes. So all of this means that this strategy is, uh, is quite general. It can technically be applied to all kinds of inductive synthesizers uh, to make them more generalizable, right? In fact, it can also be applied to AI-based uh, engines such as Copilot, something to think about. 
So another question on your minds, hopefully now is, where do these properties come from? Who provides the properties, right? And let me show you three different UIs with uh, varying degrees of user involvement to answer this question. So the first UI uh, that I have here on the left is a uh, property selection where uh, this is the one that places the most demand on the user, okay? So the user uh, selects a set of applicable properties from a set, a uh, finite set of properties, right? The second uh, UI, the second user interface uh, is the property validation UI, where for each property, the user is asked to validate or invalidate some perturbed examples, some examples obtained by applying the property to the original uh, examples, right? And if the user validates these perturbed examples, then this green uh, outer synthesis engine assumes that this property holds. Okay, and the user burden here, is, as you can see, is obviously uh, less uh, than in the first uh, UI, where the user actually has to know the property versus just validate or invalidate some examples. And finally, in this third UI, this is the property inference UI. This, I think, is the coolest UI, where we only expect the user to just provide input-output examples, okay? Uh, and uh, we are able to fully automatically infer the set of applicable properties. So this is this looks like just this looks just like the standard setting uh, for uh, example-based inductive program synthesis that we have been seeing earlier. So let's now see uh, how the outer green synthesizer uh, needs to be designed for each of these examples. I mean, the reason you, there is an outer box and an inner box is because the design of the outer box. Uh, always uses uh, an existing uh, inductive synthesizer as a black box and builds on top of it, okay? So the, the gray uh, inner box is, you can assume that to be uh, an existing inductive synthesizer that's just used as a black box. All right, so uh, let's look at the property selection UI. Uh, here, the design of the synthesizer is the simplest because the user does a lot of work. Okay, so for each user provided property, our uh, engine essentially implements our key strategy. It uh, applies the property to perturb the user provided examples and then simply uses the existing synthesizer to synthesize a program uh, from the resulting augmented set of examples. Okay, uh, so let's just introduce a perturbation engine that takes care of, of all this, of this key strategy. In the property validation UI, uh, if the user validates the examples perturbed according to a certain property, our engine assumes that this property holds and proceeds as before with our perturbation engine and uh, an existing uh, inductive synthesizer used as a black box, all right? Now in the third and the coolest uh, UI uh, that I mentioned before, our engine seeks to infer properties that are consistent with the synthesis problem at hand, okay? And uh, while it's at it, uh, what we try to do is actually infer a maximal set of properties that is consistent with the synthesis problem at hand. Now, uh, again, I'm not going to dive too deep into this, for, but for those of you who are familiar with uh, SMT solvers, satisfiability modulo theory solvers, and the partial backs SMT formulation, then let me just tell you that we pose this inference problem as a partial max SMT problem and use that to infer a maximal set of properties, okay? But we know that this is not the only way to do this. There can be many other ways to do the property inference. So let me just uh, pop in a generic property inference engine here in our pipeline that models our synthesizer design, all right? So uh, let me uh, show you how all of this works in a certain scenario that we evaluated in our bubble paper. So we specialized our framework to an existing general purpose program synthesizer called Sketch. I have added a reference to the original paper uh, here. And uh, we call our synthesis Sketch AX, Sketch with augmented examples, okay? So our data set primarily consists of benchmarks that are drawn from various repositories associated with the Sketch uh, synthesizer and uh, from a certain track of an annual uh, synthesis competition that is actually held in uh, our conferences, okay? There is this annual competition called Syntax Guided Synthesis Competition, SIGUS, 
um, which has been helping the development of uh, better and faster uh, synthesis engines. Okay. So, and um, a lot of our benchmarks are taken from a certain track of this uh, competition. The variable domains that we use are essentially uh, scalars, uh, arrays, and matrices over booleans and integers. And the program space is defined in terms of partial programs with holes, okay, which are called sketches. That is the input to the sketch programming language. So the user has to provide a program, which is, I mean, the sketches input language is essentially a C-like imperative programming language and uh, which is equipped with an additional construct for a whole, okay? And so a user provides a sketch of a program uh, with holes and that defines the space of programs that the synthesizer searches over. So this is our evaluation setup. And uh, let me first show you uh, the success rate of the different synthesis engine engines for um, benchmarks that do satisfy some properties, okay? Now, uh, what is the success rate over here? It is essentially uh, computed over 10 runs for each benchmark, with each run using a different randomly generated set of three examples. Uh, this gray one, uh, first one is, uh, is baseline sketch, and our three different UIs uh, follow this in pink, blue, and green, which is the second, third, and fourth bar, okay? So the first thing I want you to notice is that the success rate of the validation and inference UIs uh, matches that of the selection UI. Okay, so our property property inference works very well. Uh, that's that's the first thing. And the second thing that we're excited about is the actual degree of improvement. So all of these instantiations of Sketch AX provide a 60% improvement in the success rate of baseline sketch. So if you can see the success rate of baseline sketch, for these benchmarks is only about 50% and we are able to raise it to 80% uh, with our notion of property guided synthesis. And if we focus on uh, a certain type of uh, benchmarks, the bit vector benchmarks, which actually Sketch was originally designed for, then this improvement becomes even more dramatic uh, because the success rate of baseline Sketch uh, was only 30%. And we were able to improve this uh, to about one nine, uh, by, by 190%, okay? So we are very excited about uh, these results, uh, but um, this is not it. There's a lot to be done. And let me just, before telling you about what we are planning to do in the future, let me just give you a quick preview of our ongoing uh, work in a domain that I believe many of you will be interested in, just functional programs, okay? Hence the name, Sys Lambda. So, Sketch happens to be a synthesizer that is not tuned to be an inductive synthesizer, okay? Most inductive synthesizers have a lot of heuristics, uh, like I mentioned, syntactic biases that help steer them towards the correct program, okay? So one might wonder is, our, uh, is the amazing improvement that we saw uh, over Sketch primarily because it's not even designed to do inductive synthesis, okay? So we, have, we are trying out other domains as well. And uh, in this domain of functional programs, now we use another uh, state-of-the-art black box inductive synthesizer called Lambda Square, which is at least partly uh, type-driven, okay? It given exam input-output examples, it can synthesize uh, functional programs, uh, and the synthesis algorithm is, uh, is part partly type-driven, okay? So even in this domain, as this uh, example illustrates, our old problems show up, okay? So if lambda square is given this input-output example, it fails to recognize that it is trying to compute, uh, um, the user wants to compute a, a program that computes the maximum and, and obtains a program that is highly overfitted to this example, right? And we have already uh, found that our clever tactic works in this space as well, okay? So we can, again, uh, tell the synthesizer that this is supposed to be permutation invariant, generate more examples, apply the uh, semantic bias to the program space, and steer the synthesizer towards the current program. There are lots of other interesting ideas that we are exploring in this domain, including redesigning the program synthesizer to be semantics driven. But uh, this is very much ongoing work, and uh, and I, I, that, that is all I'll be able to talk about right now, okay? But ask me more about it on Slack. 
So as I move towards uh, wrapping up, let me just uh, mention some cool problems that I think we can all uh, think about in this in this space. Okay, uh, there are many opportunities, obviously, to advance similar ideas in many other synthesis domains. I just mentioned uh, functional programs, but in general, uh, you can do it for uh, string manipulation, data wrangling, SQL queries, all the other domains in which inductive program synthesis is already applied these days. Okay. So one could, I mean, so, and the strategy is, is, is what I've already told you, right? You first identify your interesting relational properties, figure out how to infer or learn such properties uh, with or without a user in the loop, and then uh, use a perturbation engine with an existing domain specific synthesizer treated as a black box like we did, right? So just using the same design, there is, there is a lot of room to explore the applicability of this idea in other domains. But what if we change our design a bit? What if we open up uh, existing synthesizers or uh, design our own synthesizers to incorporate relational properties within their search algorithms itself, right? Like we are doing in our Sys Lambda project. So this opens up the possibility to do much more, right? We don't, we are not uh, restricted to examples anymore because uh, application of these uh, relational properties required us to start from examples and generate more examples. Uh, we don't have to be restricted to examples anymore. We can uh, look at broader classes of partial specifications and we do not need to be restricted to the particular kinds of relational properties we looked at in this talk, right? Like uh, permutation invariants. We might be able to consider arbitrary relational properties and perhaps other semantic properties too that may or may not be relational. So uh, this is great. And eventually it would be interesting to uh, essentially improve how we learn about these properties. Okay, So another way to think about this whole synthesis setup is its property guided synthesis. So it would be great if we could actually learn probabilistic models of the property or semantic signature of a certain domain and use that to guide the search, right? Uh, so that is essentially the vision I have for uh, this uh, body of work. And let me wrap up uh, with uh, just a couple of slides. Uh, these are the amazing students and collaborators who have been and continue to be an essential part of this uh, project. Uh, these are all my students, past and present on the top. These are collaborators from academia and industry. And uh, here's my last slide, uh, the, the takeaway that I want you to take, I want you to remember from this talk, many of us are taking our own small and big steps towards realizing the dream of program synthesis, especially uh, in the context of partial specifications, okay? So as we do this, let's just remember to try and see how we can make use of semantic properties uh, to help realize the dream. Thank you. Hi, uh, thanks for your talk. Um, I it, the the examples you gave had um, the kind of specifications provided in uh, text, you know, in um, structured kind of JSON-like um, data formats. Do you know if there's research being done um, where? Uh, to, to appeal even to non-programmers, to people who don't think in terms of lists and integers. Um, mm -hmm. I, I'm, I'm thinking about, you know, the Excel spreadsheet being the most used pro programming language in the world. Um, people uh, specifying the computation that they want to happen um, through graphical means, um, like a spreadsheet or, um, you know, shapes, colors, that kind of thing. Okay. I'm glad you mentioned spreadsheets because uh, Microsoft Excel since 2013, I believe, has been shipped with an inbuilt program synthesizer. Okay, and so there, this was one of this is one of the biggest success stories of uh, program synthesis. So uh, there is a program synthesizer that can actually generalize from uh, users' uh, input output uh, uh, data and generalize that. Uh, to essentially infer the, the intent of the user and generalize it to multiple rows, okay? So there is work on this. There is work on uh, taking natural language specifications and trying to interpret them uh, more precisely. There is work on uh, trying to use other, uh, other graphical methods of uh, using specifications and 
trying to uh, make them more precise. So yes, people are looking at multiple modes of specifications. Thank you. Hi. Um, so what, the, like your example, you use the, the dream of the max function. Uh, so what's sort of the current state of the art, uh, like complexity of dreams that have a realistic chance of you know, generating reasonable right. success rates? So, so it depends on which, uh, I, I mentioned three parts of the program synthesis dream, right? So it, it depends on which of these or how many of these are important to you. For instance, co-pilot can do a lot, right? But it cannot uh, ensure uh, correctness of any kind. It cannot even ensure that the programs uh, generated can compile. So it can handle programs of, of uh, I mean, it can scale well. It can take uh, specifications that are very natural looking, but uh, uh, it, it doesn't do well on the correctness part. On the other hand, many of us in academia who are focused more on correctness, uh, I think the main challenge that we are facing is actually uh, scalability of the synthesis engine. So the kinds of programs that we are able to synthesize are still small, right? Uh, but they are correct. So uh, uh, I can't quantify where we are right now, uh, but the... The goal is to find the right uh, trade-off or sweet spot between scalability and uh, correctness while ensuring that the specifications are easy to obtain. Thank you. Thanks for your talk. Um, I was wondering about um, if there's any current research on uh, synthesizing specifications, like formal specifications, which then you could derive um, programs from synthesizing them and then they're automatically correct. Great question. Uh, yes, there is work on specification inference from uh, existing programs that are more or less believed to be uh, trusted to be correct, trusted code bases uh, or, or big code uh, repositories. There is work on specification inference as well. And there, on the other hand, uh, so this is, this is pro. This is these are specifications that are exist extracted from existing code bases, and uh, on the other hand, uh, complementary to this approach, there is work, as I mentioned earlier, on interpreting uh, uh, user uh, documentation, comments, and so on, and trying to extract some properties from there, some specification from there as well. Okay, I think we are at time and we're going to um, close the session there. Thanks you so much for, to Rupsha. Thank you.